Hello there. My name is Sue Shardlow. I'm the Developer Community Manager here at Redis. Thanks for joining us today for this week on Discord. If you're new to this week on Discord, it does what it says on the tin. So we here at Redis have a community Discord server, which you are very welcome to join. Just go to discord.gg slash Redis, where we love to hang out all day on our working days which for those of us in America and the US is Monday to Friday, for the folks in Israel, Sunday to Thursday. Um, we love to hang out there and talk about all things Reddit. So if you want to join us on there, please do. It's absolutely free. We just ask that you adhere to our code of conduct. So this week we have four or five little things that we want to highlight to you that uh, piqued our interest on the Discord server. I feel like it's definitely getting darker. I don't know, like next week it's going to be pitch black outside. But yeah, the uh, the nights are definitely drawing in. So it's all uh, very nice and cozy here for this week on Discord. Today I'm joined by Simon and Justin from my team. I'm going to ask them to put themselves in the mix because it's a toggle on and off. We're going to hit this button at the same time, you know it, and uh, confusion is going to ensue. So Simon and Justin, please join me in the studio. Hello. 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 How are you, Simon? How are you? All right. It's well, as it always is at this point when we do this, it's Friday evening here and it's the last Friday before uh, the end of daylight savings time here in the UK. So I'll have to work out what time to show up for this next week. But um, OK, it's getting dark out there. So I'm hoping my light situation stays pretty stable. Yeah, we need a bit of a scrum down, don't we, to figure out what time we're doing it, because UTC will remain the same, but UTC versus us will be different, UTC versus Justin will be different, but not for another week. Yeah, I, I'm confused already. So, uh, <laughs> just, <laughs> Justin, how are you today? I'm doing good. It's uh, it's also a little dark, but it's morning time, uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to the rest of my day. Um, but yeah, it's... It's dark enough that the birds aren't out, but it's light enough that I can see everywhere. So, so that early twilight, I guess. Dawn. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely going to get to the point where, like, so I woke up this morning at about half five and it was dark. And I, it's definitely going to get to the point where you wake up and it's dark and you're like, oh, good. It's only 2 a.m. And then you realize it's actually like 6 a.m. And it's nearly time <laughs> to get on. I'm like, no, I don't like it. As you can tell, I'm not a fan, but... Uh, Unfortunately, we just have to live with it, don't we? So, uh, yeah, if you are watching us, please let us know in the chat. How dark is it where you are? And what time is it? Because we love to know. We have someone from Uzbekistan, which is really cool. I don't think I've ever seen anyone from Uzbekistan in the chat there. So, assalamu alaikum to you too. And Mevlik, Morgan Hill, California. Let us know where you are, how dark it is, what time it is, all of that good stuff. And also, we were just talking before we went live about accidentally sharing stuff, accidentally sharing our screens and like being very careful as what we share. And I feel like I'm cursing myself now because uh, I'm accidentally going to share something that I shouldn't be. But if you if you want to share in the chat any accidental shares that you shared on your screen we you shouldn't have done, please let us know. We feel better then. But um, yeah, we have to be very careful here when we go live. <laughs> that we're only sharing the screens that we want because we've got at least three screens each and stuff. And I'm a bit paranoid about that. I'm scared that I'm going to make a mistake. <laughs> Just, uh, yeah. Anyway, let's get started with today's, well, not all questions, some discussion points, and also a very nice piece of feedback that we got today. So let's have a look at what we've got. So the first one is a question. And um, somebody was doing a challenge on one of our courses. So in case you didn't know, we run a few courses here at Redis. If you go to university.redis.com, you can check them all out. Doing a course, they're doing challenge one on the course. They noticed that the key for the set was test.sites.ids. Um, and they had a question about that. So I think Simon and Justin, you're going to have a chat about this one, aren't you? Yeah, so I've got some, <clears throat> excuse me, some stuff to share here. So let me add the desktop in. Here we go. So yeah, this is a lot of code. Um, let's just take it back a minute. Uh, we have a uh, university.redis.com. There's three programming courses on here. So there's Java, JavaScript, and Python. They're what we call the 102 series of courses. 
all of them share like a common um, a common enough data model and a common concept. So you're working in a course where when you're doing these coding challenges, they're not marked, they're just for like fun and your own education. You're filling out gaps in the code that we've left and the aim is to make some tests run successfully. So you're running test suites. Um, and the way that these work is in Redis, it's a really good idea to keep your keys organized somehow. So um, you can, we often encourage using colon as a sort of namespace separator. So you might have, you know, you 102 j colon sites because the, um, the application talks about solar sites and then colon 101 where 101 is site ID. Um, and then if you know that you want a site and you know the idea is 101, you can manufacture the key. And it's a really, really good idea to keep those sort of under control and centrally managed because it's your application that's managing those, not the data store. Um, so we sort of encourage a central key manager class. And then these applications, they have tests that run and those tests create keys and they tear them down again afterwards. And what we wanted was to be able to run the tests in the same database as you've got the actual for want of a better word, production data set in that's making the application work. You obviously wouldn't do this for real. You'd use a separate Redis database. So what we've done here is, and you can see it here in the Java course, is we have a key manager class, or in this case, a test key manager that extends that. And it handles, it has methods for generating all the key names. And here we give it a new prefix of test. And then in the real application, we don't give it that. And this is because then when we, um, come to clear down after a test, we have some code that basically just says, hey, scan for keys that begin with test colon and blow them all away because we know that they're test keys and they're not um, they're not application keys. And then I just pulled up the sort of the key generator class from the JavaScript course because that's kind of where I'm a little bit more familiar. And you can see that we sort of have a function here that chucks a key and a prefix together separated by a colon, so we make it even bigger. Um, and then we have you know, utility functions. So this is a good example of how to organize keys in Redis. It's like put everything that deals with Redis keys in one class or one place if you can, and just call these methods. So you know, here we've got a get site hash key. So this is similar to what they were looking for. Uh, you give it a site ID and it returns sites, colon, info, colon, whatever the site ID is. So if you wanted to um, change this up, you've got one place in your application that manages it because let's say the, the database doesn't enforce that. Um, so anything to add, Justin? Uh, no, I think you did really well. Um, and you'll see these in all of our videos too, how we actually organize um, our key naming. And you can have multiple uh, unique IDs within one key as well. So location, colon, ID, colon, employee, colon, employee ID, or something like that. Um, so the more you actually uh, take our coursework or uh, watch our videos or anything like that, you'll see this in actual action. So, Yeah, and I just brought up Redis Insight because I remember this approach helps you um, sort of manage Redis Insight as well. So if you're using this, which is our visual tool, you can get a view that is just like, give me all the keys and it doesn't matter. So here's one like some list that doesn't match the rest. And this is from my streaming Thursday's project. So I've used Pico project because it was a Raspberry Pi Pico project. And then I have all the different, so room 214 is data about rooms and we have, it does something else that we cover on there. But if you go to this tree view here, you can um, basically then use this as a sort of you know, way of browsing down and look, making more sense of this key space because it's namespace. So again, I've used colons here and that's the default for um, Insight, but you can configure that. So if you want to use something else as well, that's obviously not a part of your data set normally, then, then you can do. It's also really nice. Um, and I, I kind of learned this more recently when we were working on RU204, which is Redis JSON with uh, Redis Search. Um, you can index uh, multiple key prefixes uh, into one single index. And so it just, um, it encourages you to have a consistent uh, key naming convention like how we do. Um, yeah. So um, in my video, I cover food trucks with the key prefix truck colon. Um, I could do vendor colon and truck colon, and they'd both be indexed by Redis Search. So um, it just, we, we create an environment uh, naturally by the way everything is coded to encourage good key naming conventions. I think 
that also is a thing that you can take advantage of from Redis 6 upwards with the ACL security model. So you can create named users that can only have access to certain amounts of key space. And the way you do that is by basically saying what the common prefix is. So you, like Justin could only have keys that begin Justin colon. I could only have keys that begin Simon colon. And in that way, we can sort of separate from a security perspective who sees what. So we got a question. Um, is it encouraged to use uppercase in keys? Um, I mean, officially, it really doesn't matter. We've got another question that follows on that will sort of expand on what a key is in Redis. But um, I mean, whatever convention you like works. Um, if you don't have to use columns to separate, you could use something else. Um, but basically, any binary sequence is a good key name. So what a good key name is, is kind of up to you. Um, and we are, I'm sort of, not not answering this properly but we we literally have a question that follows this one that addresses this <laughs> and um thanks to captain codeman who's also on the stream who gave their own um take on this uh, question that somebody just asked they say it doesn't matter but they usually find uppercase just takes up more space in tools etc which is very true so yeah thanks for that answer i had hadn't personally thought of that but yeah it's uh, true. Captain Codeman as well. Thank you for joining us. Captain Codeman is one of our certified Redis geeks. Uh, maybe at the end, Justin, you can talk about what a certified Redis geek is. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining us on the stream today. So let's move on to the next question. So um, this person was taking the node course. So they're taking RU102JS, I believe. And they were going along happy in that course, watching the videos. And they said, hello, in the video about metrics and sorted sets, it said that one of the advantages of implementing it that way is that multiple measurements per key saves memory. Why is that? That is the million dollar question. So that's, I'm adjusting. that's kind of what I was saying about, ah, we have something that follows on from this. Um, so, yeah just a bit of background on this so the um the way that a lot of the data works in those courses is we have like we saw sort of a site and a site id and that's one key and those keys um map to redis hashes and those hashes uh store multiple things so we're gonna live a little bit dangerously on this one and do something we've not done on this stream before and try drawing things, which is something if you see me do on my Thursday streams, sometimes it goes great and sometimes it causes the Mac to have a total meltdown. Um, so basically, if you think of Redis, I'll use red because, you know, Redis, we generally draw it as red. If you think of Redis as something like this, it's a great big box and it has like two things. Um, it has keys and values, right? So it's sort of a great big hash table. Um, so if this is like, key and this is value then the thing with redis is you can um store different types of things in a key and they will get behaviors and storage according to what that is so if you had a key called my hash in here you'd have like a mini redis right so it would be a bunch of name value pairs so name value name value and so on and that lives inside there um and the the question was, why do we do this rather than maybe have a key for each of those names? Um, there's a few sort of ways of answering that, but specifically with memory, it's because everything in Redis lives in memory. Both of these things, uh, so the, the key and the value, take up memory. And there is a sort of sweet spot with designing keys. So, you know, you could say, oh, if keys take up memory, then we should have keys that look like, you know, A, B, or 99 e f x or, or something uh, but those are largely meaningless and then someone looking at the data store has to figure that out or an application has to figure that out um so you sort of need to strike a balance between how much memory you're using with the keys and um what it means to you and then also what you're putting in the keys depends on or what value you use you know, some things compress better than others. So if you're running a Redis stream and the data doesn't change very often, that compresses pretty well, even though you may be putting lots of data in there. 
if you're running a list, the way that lists work is they'll actually change the way that they're stored in memory when you hit the sort of tipping point in the list size. So the data structures are kind of optimized for that. Uh, but the question was specifically back to the keys. So other things we can store in keys, and I'm going to run out of uh, boxes here, would be, believe it or not, like an empty string is a valid key. Is it a good idea? Probably not. Um, but the key can be anything up to 512 megabytes, and it's binary safe. So if you chose to key things, and there are applications where you might want to do this off of basically like a JPEG image is the key, and then you know you pass the JPEG image in, and uh, you get some values out. Is that good from a network bandwidth perspective? No. Can you do it? Yes. Then um, you start to be like, oh, now I've got 512 meg for my key and all of my data. So if you have to then like use multiple keys for things, the keys could become very big. So it's one of those like uh, it kind of depends answers. And um, there's a page that um, I think Sue's put in the chat, the Redis data types tutorial. And before it even talks of any data types, it talks about keys. Um, and as it says here, you know, keys are binary safe. Um, you can use foo, you shouldn't. I really dislike foo bar bas type applications. Don't even use them in demo code, it's meaningless. Um, but yeah, this this has some ideas about like very it it's kind of like the three bears and the porridge. It's like you know, too hot, too cold, just right. It's like what's just right, you kind of have to figure that out for your data set and the people that are working with it. Um, but we generally recommend this sort of pattern of user colon some ID colon whatever. Um, and especially if you're using Redis search where you've got other ways of dereferencing that data. So yeah, um, Justin, have you got any experience you want to add here? Yeah, um, this is great. And when, whenever you're creating a key, no matter what, there's going to be an allocated amount of, of space dedicated to it. So um, it just behooves you to, to use one key for, if possible, more than one piece of information, like a hash. Um, and yeah, we always, <laughs> Uh, Redis employees always love to share the fun little uh, trivia that you could store <laughs> 512 megabytes of, of data within a key. So don't do that, please. Yeah. Um, in RU 101, in one of our videos that Susan and I did, I demonstrated that we could actually uh, encode uh, pictures uh, into, into Redis. And while we could do that, it's, it's just not the best idea. <laughs> Yeah, I think the other thing that this page doesn't address, um, which again we have a course for, which is you know a recurring theme here, is okay. So there's an argument that says, "Oh, keys take up memory. I only use like name value pairs, uh, so why don't I just chuck them all in a hash? Because a hash can take like two to the power of thirty-two things inside the hash." Um, you got to remember as well that the entire data set has to fit in memory. So one of the ways that we scale Redis is sharding so splitting a data set over multiple servers and then having a map of which keys live where so if you put everything in too few keys you're limiting your ability to do that um again no, no right answer it's just kind of like try it and see but kind of know what options are available to you yeah definitely just like observing the timings of everything uh looking at a slow log if something actually goes really slow um, or noticeably slow and um just basically tuning your your key names um, and the way you implement your data set um, as you go along. Yeah, that is definitely a good lesson, a good example, if ever there was one, of just because you can do something doesn't mean you should, yeah. isn't it? Um, and yeah, and that's coming back to me about what you said, um, said in RU101. And RU101 is a really good place to start if you want to know about the fundamentals of Redis and all the data types. And you can find that on university.redis.com. And uh, Simon, when you just mentioned sharding, that is not something that I hear a lot about because we in the developer relations team don't talk about that. We don't talk about servers and things like that. We talk about how to use the actual tool. Um, but I remember when I first joined and I met uh, the guy who's like basically head of sales at Redis. And he said, I really love your surname, Shard Low, because if you're low on shards, then you need to buy some more. I was like, <laughs> oh, always thinking about selling. I love that. I just uh, see it everywhere. So now I can't forget that. And I feel like uh, I feel like that needs to be used more. I feel like that needs to be used more. So, um, oh, so we've had a little comment here from Sandeep. Let's put that on the, uh, on the screen. Hello, Sandeep. 
Sandeep says, hello, everyone. Thanks for Hacktoberfest. I just completed all four pull requests. And then they followed that up with, can't wait for next year. Sandeep, you've still got three days to uh, to do more pull requests. So don't get excited about next year yet. Yeah, see how many more you can get in before the end of the month. <laughs> but, uh, you know, thanks for joining us today. And thanks for taking part in Hacktoberfest. And for those of you that don't know what Hacktoberfest is, like I said, it's not too late. You've still got a couple more days. Hacktoberfest is a month long um, celebration of open source where maintainers, open source maintainers work to help contributors to sometimes to make their first contributions to open source. If you don't know what open source is, it is something that is freely available to people. I'm trying to put this really simply, freely available to people to look at and use for their own purposes, sometimes with some very kind of small restrictions, but essentially you can take it and use it as you like and add to it and things like that. A maintainer is somebody who owns and uh, kind of is the custodian of that thing. So here at Redis, we have a number of uh, repositories on GitHub with lots of code, demos, the actual Redis software is open source as well. Um, so here in the DevRel team, we made a number of repositories um, open and open up a load of issues that were suitable for people to get involved in open source for the first time. So I'm really glad you joined us here today, Sandeep. Thank you so much for that feedback. We really loved working with everybody as well. And there are still some um, issues that are up for grabs. So if you want to uh, get a full, few more pull requests in or you just want to start Hacktoberfest, um, then go to redis.io slash community slash Hacktoberfest. My job is so fun because I get to remember all the URLs off by heart. So redis.io <laughs> slash community slash Hacktoberfest. Go on there. You'll find a link to all of our currently open issues. There is actually one that is front end. So if any of you are watching you've got front end skills, uh, it's not all back end. So there's definitely a front end one in there that you can contribute to. And the reason why Sandeep mentioned that they had done four pull requests is because the people that run the overarching Hacktoberfest project, so DigitalOcean is the company that runs that project, they have an incentive. So if you submit four pull requests that are merged and approved by the maintainers, then they have an incentive for you. So if you want to find out about the incentive, go to hacktoberfest.com. We here at Redis are not involved in the allocation of incentives. That's all done by DigitalOcean but we do deem whether or not your pull request is acceptable to be merged into our code base. So um, that's as far as our involvement goes, but we had great pleasure in helping you all to get involved in open source this October. Ah, oh, Sandeep. Oh, there's a few comments in here. Somebody's put Sandeep is a rock star. Yep, that's cool. We cannot confirm or deny, but I, I trust you, the stand user. Nope. I can confirm it. Sandeep can is, he's also uh, um, a certified uh, Redis developer. So he's hes received his certification. So I consider him a rock star. I know Sandeep now, sailing with Sandeep on GitHub. Sailing with yeah. Yep. It's because Sandeep uses a different name on Git Discord. I won't divulge what their name is on Discord so I could keep that uh, privacy intact. But um, that did throw me a little bit. Sandeep did uh, did hide a little bit away from me and I got confused. I thought it was two different people. So <laughs> Sandeep actually would like to know, can one of you tell us about your journey, how you got into Redis? I think, I you think, uh, about I think that'd be cool. Doing a little series on this, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. Um, like, I'm gonna ask both of you to just give me 30 seconds on how you got into Redis, because I think both of you have got an interesting thought, but keep it very brief, because we don't want to go into Guy's, <laughs> guys <laughs> stream, which is straight after us. So Justin, do you want to go first? 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was a coding boot camp instructor. So I uh, taught actual classes, uh, full, full stack uh, web development, and I have a CS background. So I also taught them interview prep and stuff like that. And I loved teaching. Um, and then um, after that, I worked uh, as a software engineer for a automated testing company. Um, and that was a lot of fun, but I just was like, I want to talk more. I want to share more. I want to profess more. Um, and I actually got um, a call from a recruiter at Redis. They're like, hey, 
would you like to talk a lot at Redis? I'm like, I like talking and I love Redis. It's like one of the backbones of the company I was working with. And um, the rest is history. I worked uh, out of the Mountain View remotely. So I went there every once in a while, shot a couple of videos. They liked me. Um, and here I am two years later. Oh, nice. I love that story. Simon. Nice. Um, I'll do a slightly different angle. How did I start using the product? Um, I was working for a consulting company that primarily built mobile app front ends for people. And we got hired by a company that was trying to be acquired by another company. They had got some performance targets to hit for their mobile app, and they thought that their front end was the problem. So they hired us to fix it. We started digging around and found they got a really, really, really very terrible and slow API. Um, and myself and a couple of the other consultants ran a small project there to basically cache that with Redis. It was a Java backend and it used some hideous XML database. But basically we cached all the key, key responses with Redis, uh, which sped the thing up continuously. So it kind of just became something that I started, that I wasn't previously aware of and I started working with like that. Um, and then really quickly I got into the company because I used to do sort of um, ad hoc developer relations at various places I was working with sort of API docs and talking about how to use them. And there was an education job back in the day when we had a just education team and, and Deborah was different. And uh, so I joined to work on the, the Redis for JavaScript course and um, sort of expanded out from there. Yeah. And if you go to Simon's website, which is there underneath his uh, picture, simonprickett.dev, you can see there is a uh, there's a little project you did. I think it was bus or train tickets with a contactless card, wasn't it? Um, yeah. You... As, as part of like um, figuring out working here, I thought I'll do a project with the thing and write about it because that's kind of what the job was. So I did that and um, that turned out to be a good thing to use up interview time with people on. Yeah, I would highly recommend if anyone wants to go into the sort of job that we've got, if you do have time, and I know not everybody has, to make a project using the technology that you are, that you want to evangelize about, then uh, that's a really good idea. But yeah, if you go to simoncricket.dev, you can find that their project there immortalized in history, where it all began with Simon's career at Redis. Um, and Sandeep said, yes, they read that blog. Sandeep, you were a super fan. This is great, cool. Right, we only have another 28 minutes. Let us crack on very swiftly here. So we're on question three. Um, hello, I have a question. I love it when people say, hello, I have a question. You know exactly where you stand. You know, like they don't just come on and say hello and then go away. It's like sometimes people do that on Slack, don't they? They're like, hi. <laughs> like, there is actually a website. I think it says something like, what does it say? Like, don't say hi or something. And it gives you all the reasons as to why you shouldn't just say hi and run. So, hello, I have a question. Is it possible to change send command in a transaction? It works fine without the box commands, da, 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 or should the transaction be in the send command? Kind of newbie, kind of confused. Thank you. Look, don't worry about being a newbie. Don't worry about being confused. We all got to get that feeling once in a while, even us seasoned Redis people. So, Simon and Justin, over to you. Okay, so this this is a Node.js question, and there's like a couple of things in here. So the way most of the Redis clients work is you get a client instance in whatever language you're working with, JavaScript, Python, C Sharp, uh, Java, for example, and then you have a function that's named for each Redis command that you call. So like if you want to call h get all, you do client dot h get all. Um, one of the things with Redis is if you want to send multiple commands to Redis at once and have them all operate without other commands happening on the server, so you want to like update three things and make sure that those three things get updated without anyone else having access to them while you're doing that, you use something called a transaction, which exposes as something called multi, which is named after the command in Redis that starts a transaction. And you can chain these function calls on and then do exec for like send the whole transaction to the server and do it. The second part of this is, well, what's send command? So most clients support the fact that Redis might be updated faster than the client is. So if you have a new command, so you've just got Redis 7.whatever and your client's not updated yet and there's some command you want to run, 
send command is generally your sort of back door into just pass it a string representation of what command you want to run. It'll throw it at the Redis server, run it, and you'll get results. And they might not be as parsed out as well into your language as they would be uh, you know, with a function that's specifically designed to run that command. Uh, two reasons that might happen is newer version of Redis than your client, but also you might have extended Redis yourself with a module and, and you're going to have to call those commands like that. So what I'm going to do is uh, share the screen here. And we've got some code here. So we're basically just starting up a Redis client with Node Redis. So I've got this client thing. I'm connecting to Redis. And then, as I said, there's, there's functions named after commands. So I can do hset. Um, I can make this a bit bigger as well because live streaming. I can do hset and I pass it in. So here I pass in a key name and then an object that I want to set. So it's sort of a bit more nicely JavaScript friendly. Or I could do it this way. Imagine hset was a command that like didn't exist in Node Redis or it was a command that I'd added with a module. So I can call it this way. I can do send command and then I have to pass it in an array of the strings that I want to uh, throw at Redis. The node Redis will throw it there and you'll get back an array of responses that you'll have to parse out. Then if I want to do a transaction, normally I just I can do client.multi and then I can start chaining commands onto it. So this transaction consists of do this, do that, do the other thing, and then exec it. So the question is, how do I use or can I use this sort of some extra command or some new command in a transaction? So you would think you can just do well, send command and then an array of things and this doesn't actually work and you'll get an error at runtime and the reason why is basically because for some reason in the transaction context it's actually called add command not send command um so this is how you do it then in terms of what can we do about that i actually replied to the person in discord and i said first off i can make an example for this no redis has examples so we can go away and um and add an example. But also because we Redis the company maintain this client, I can talk to the maintainer about, you know, well, let's add send command as an alias for add command in here because that's what people maybe expect. Um, so it's at least consistent. So if you if you find things like this, please do bring them up. This is not at all a silly question. It's quite a good developer experience thing of your experience your expected experience would be you can do this. In fact, you have to do that, and it wasn't very well documented. So we'll fix the documentation because we can do that like almost immediately. And then we'll figure out if we can fix the, the code to match expectations whilst not breaking you know, code bases that are out there already. Cool. Justin, you want to add anything to that? That was a fantastic cover. Um, I yeah, just want to reiterate that yeah, when there is something a little quirky going on, or if you have questions, uh, we do you know kind of digitally rub elbows with the maintainers of this code, um, and I've I've covered a lot of these commands in uh, Redis Monthly Live, a series that I used to do with um, uh, monthly with Guy Royce, and uh, we talk about different commands, and sometimes there'd be quirks, and I'd be like is this supposed to happen? Is this an intended side effect? Or is this, you know, are, are we branching out what's going on with this one? Um, so we we are a living, breathing, open source um, uh, entity, Redis. So, you know, if, if something that you would think would improve uh, the quality of life of your code, you definitely let us know. Um, or create a PR or create a, create an issue and we can, we can you know, definitely take a look at it. Hmm. Can, while I'm talking, can somebody just deal with that comment in Twitch? I, think, I don't think it's a bona fide, but it just seems a bit odd. Um, probably needs deleting. So, yes, if you find something that doesn't quite work right for you in our software, don't automatically assume it's you that's doing it wrong, especially if you spent ages trying to figure it out. Um, please do ask, and it might it might turn out that actually we, need, we do need to add something in to make it easier for you as a developer. So let's have a look at this uh, question. What about transactions in cluster environment with multi-keys, commands, and key slots, hash? Do you know of any PDF or URL with best practices for that? But that is quite a big question. I don't think we, any of us know that off the top of our head. What about transactions in cluster environment with multi-key, commands, and multi-key? 
I don't off the top of my head, other than I know it sounds like a generic response. We literally have a course that covers this as well. <laughs> now that'd actually be a good opportunity to actually try that out. So <laughs> I'll have to set up a, a multi-cluster setup and see what's going on. Yeah. So maybe we'll do that as a um we'll look into that and follow back up because it would need a bit of prep time. So yeah. we could maybe table that for a future version of this stream. Cool. We have noted your question. We'll get back to you on that one, but thank you for asking. This is very much uh, the, the only bits we've scripted are the questions that we have picked out of Discord. So uh, yeah, anything that you throw at us, we may not necessarily know the answer to you. Right, I think we need to ban Daniel Sherrard. Can somebody jump on and do that while I'm talking? Is that all right? Sure. I, uh, I did delete a couple of Whoever it is should probably mute as well in case when you bring Twitch up, it shows this live stream and you get some horrible thing. Yes. Um, right. Sandeep has made a comment or a question. One last question. It's almost 12 here. Wow. Okay. Uh, can I contribute more into some issues? Earlier said that you said one each to make availability. Yes. So for Hacktoberfest, we did say we're only allowing people to take one each um, just so that we can spread the love amongst the community and more people get a chance to deal with our issues. Um, the exception being, if you have front end skills, we're allowing everybody to pile in on the CSS issue because we are back end engineers. Basically, we work for a database company. So um, the more of you that can do the CSS, the better. And so if you've already taken one issue of ours and you want to do the CSS one as well, please do the CSS one. We are leaving open all month. We are not closing that issue. So several contributors can come on um, and open a PR against that. That is the one exception. We are we're keeping it as one issue each. The CSS issue, um, it is, I think it's the geo search command. Yeah, it's basically. We've got a little repo that shows off changes to the, some of the geo commands in Redis 6, where you could do a box as well as a radius. And I built it with Bulma, because uh, you know you, you want to show this with a map and some points and some cool stuff. Um, and it kind of looks like I built it, built it because I'm not a front end engineer. So it's just a general take this and without adding any more dependencies and don't introduce Webpack or any sort of build system um, because it's not, you know, it's not the point of the demo. Uh, just take Bulma and like do something neater with it. So somebody's already had a go at it, but we recycle it straight back into the someone else can have a go at it. It can be cumulative. Um, so if you fancy a look, then uh, go to the Hacktoberfest thing. There's a link there that will pull up all of our issues, and it should be easy to find. Yeah, when you, when you all are talking about the next question, I'll pull it up and I'll share the screen at the end so people can see what we mean about that. Cool. Okay, next question. So it's um, talking about deduplication. So hello, is there a way to add a deduplication to a pub sub with multiple workers all streaming the same data? So there, you can see Simon there asked a clarifying question. And then the person helpfully came back with a diagram, which helps us to see a bit clearer what they actually meant. So Simon and Justin, over to you. OK. Um yeah, so initially I was sort of wondering why have you got four things that publish the same information? Um, you know, maybe you could put something upstream of those that, uh, or sorry, I sort of mis misunderstood the question. I think I was like, have you got four things that are consuming the same information and you only really want one of them to handle each message, which consumer groups would be useful for. But if you've got like a data source that keeps throwing the same thing over and over into multiple workers and they're putting things into uh, Redis PubSub, then PubSub's ephemeral. So there's no way of saying what's been published recently or even what's in a queue because there isn't that sort of idea. If nothing's listening, it just goes away. So you would need to introduce another data structure to be like, have I seen this? Yeah, you'd have to like serialize the message or use an ID or whatever you've got to know it's unique to see if it's been seen before and then you're obviously going to then build a data structure that's going to get massive because if you've got a constant stream of data. You can't remember everything you've ever seen before in case it turns up again. Um, in which case, you then want to look at like, well, how long am I likely to see duplicates of this? You know, is it in the day or the five minutes or whatever? 
I used to work with a mesh network that um, it would send uh, five, 10 copies of each message out onto the mesh and they'd all come to a gateway. And some of them would never make it because they'd time out after so many hops around the network and some of them would. And you wanted to know that you received one and pass that on and not the others. So I've used Redis for that before where you cache like the IDs of the messages you've received. And then you know within a certain time period that there won't be any more for that ID because so if you've received it, you don't send any more downstream, you drop them. If you haven't uh, received it, you send it downstream. And if a period of time passes, you just let it drop out of the cache because you know that all those messages aren't relevant after like two minutes or whatever. They're like temperature messages in a, in a hotel room. So you just stop passing them on. So in this case, if we want to flip to the next slide, there was a bit of a discussion about how to solve this. And there's a few data structures that could be useful. So you could put things in a sorted set and then sort of get time. If you sorted them by score being a timestamp, you could do time ranges. You could put them in a set if you've got unique IDs. Or you could put them in a bloom filter, which is kind of like a lossy set. So it's going to lie sometimes. It's going to be wrong a little bit, but it's going to save a lot of memory, which is your primary problem with remembering everything you've ever seen forever. Um, so again, it's one of those like, yeah, you'll need to do something. And the answer what you do actually depends. And then um, community pointed out as well that this will add extra round trips to Redis. So on top of your publish, you've now got to check if it's in whatever the structure is, whichever structure you're using. So you could move that if you really care about that sort of round trip performance into Lua in Redis and have a sort of check and set script that says, oh, I'm either going to publish this or I'm going to throw it out because I've seen it recently. And that's kind of one way you can do the duplication. Um, so the, the sort of short answer is if you've got a lot of memory or your data sets relatively small or it, it's time critical and after that you can lose all of it, then you could use a set and be 100% accurate. If you're trying to stretch out that memory use over a longer period, use a bloom filter and accept that you'll get the odd false positive, which in this case, I think actually means you'll throw away things that you didn't mean to rather than you'll send multiple. Cool. And as, as always, there is Lua that we can use, um, which sometimes I, I forget about using. But yeah, uh, the last one to make it atomic, check set publish or check skip. Um, saves even more round trips, which might be best, depending on their use case. Yeah, and I've put a little linky there in the chat. If you want to know more about Redis Bloom, check out the link. Cool. OK, let's skip slightly backwards to the Hacktoberfest question. So um, if you go to redis.io slash community slash Hacktoberfest, you will arrive at our Hacktoberfest uh, 2022 at Redis. On that page, uh, in the second section, you'll find a link to the list of our current open issues. If you click that, it'll take you to a nice neat list of our current open issues. So these are the ones that we have open at the moment. We did have more than 30 of them open. And because folks have been so enthusiastic over the month, uh, we only have five open at the moment. It says six because our colleague Steve has sort of like an overarching issue here. He did have seven open, which have all been closed via pull request, but he's kept the overarching issue open in case anyone wants to suggest an issue. So that's not a, a sort of a defined issue, um, but there are other defined issues here. And if you come down to the bottom, then you'll find the CSS one. At the bottom, you click on that, then you will find issue that uh, Simon and I were talking about earlier. Everything you need to know is written in here. Simon's really good at writing issues. <laughs> so everything you need to know is in that issue. And then you can see somebody did open a pull request that we have merged. So you feel free to check that out. Like I said, it's all open source. But also make sure you do your own thing as well. Don't worry about what other people have done. You know, Use your own imagination because the beauty of CSS is you're just limited. By your own imagination and everyone's got a different style so that is uh, the one and only issue that uh, a lot of people can uh, weigh in on and contribute to right let's get back to our questions we only have one more left and actually 
it is not a question. Let me just flip to the next one. It is a lovely piece of feedback from the community. So somebody wrote to us on Discord and said, I'd just like to say that this server has the best community support I've ever seen. Seriously impressed. So yeah, thank you uh, for writing that. We love it. We love you. And uh, we're there every day, like I said, uh, every working day to chat to you. So feel free to join us at Discord GG slash Redis. If you are not a member yet and you're kind of thinking, oh, you know what? I don't know about signing up to this new thing. I don't really know what Discord's about or whatever. Look, let me just show you and remove some of the mystery of this thing before you have to sign up. So this is what it looks like to me. I have the special privileges because I work here, but this is essentially what it's gonna look like to you. So we've got a number of uh, sort of general channels up here. That's where you start, start here. Then we've got some channels that are kind of about like, you know, what's going on at the moment or what do you need to know? Things that we wanna draw your attention to. So if we're gonna have an event or anything like that, or if there's something current like Cactoberfest, then you can see that in there. And that's the channel that I'm currently viewing here. So you can see that the person actually who did the CSS pull request has said to us, I'll open a pull request in here. And um, in Discord, you can have different roles. So everybody who has had a pull request merged by us for Hacktoberfest has been given the Hacktoberfest 2022 role in Discord. Some people have got more than one role. So Sandeep, who you saw earlier, has the certified Redis Geek role and also the Hacktoberfest 2022 role. So that's cool too. Um, and we've got some general discussion channels. Um, you can introduce yourself if you want to, things like that. People from people find us from all different places. So one of the places um, that people find us through is Redis University. And you can see there that we have a channel for every single course that we run at Redis University, as well as the developer certification. And here at the bottom, you can see a voice channel for office hours. So every Thursday, afternoon we are here on discord in this office hours channel on the voice channel so if you've got any questions then you can come and join us in that voice channel and ask and uh, we will happily chat to you about that if you're a member of discord then um, at the top you'll be able to see events if you click on that, you can see all the events that are coming up. So the only upcoming event at the moment there is Guy's Stream, which is straight after us. Um, and also, if you happen to be logged into Discord at the time an event goes live, then this all will turn green and it will tell you what the event is and it will, it will give you a nice handy link to get there. So it's a really good, I mean, I'm probably biased, but it's a really good thing to have on in the background. And then uh, as long as you don't mind more notifications, I guess, then it will remind you when things are happening. So that is it for uh, Discord. Justin, did you just want to give a quick two minutes on um, certification, just in case anybody is interested in that? Because we did mention it earlier when we talked about certified Redis geeks. Absolutely. Um, so developer certification uh, within Redis means that uh, you take an exam that is hard. Uh, if you've taken some of our courses before within Redis University, um, it will probably be much harder than that. Um, and it's intentional. We want to make sure that uh, you have all the skill set to demonstrate that you have earned this specific certification. Um, and we do have prerequisites. It used to be a paid paid exam, uh, but now it's, it's free of charge. But we do ask that you um, take prerequisites. So are you 101, Intro to Data Structures within Redis? Um, are you 202, which is Redis Streams, a huge part of Redis, um, and then a uh, elective, and that could be any other course. And once you've taken those three courses, um, the exam will be unlocked after you've enrolled in a Redis certification program, where basically we prep you, we give you some uh, you know, sample exam questions, things like that. And um, once you are enrolled into that exam, you can take that exam at your leisure. Uh, once you start, it is timed. So uh, something to keep in mind, have like, you know, an open 90 minutes in front of you when you start the test. And uh, yeah, uh, I test, I grade all of the tests uh, once a week um, because it, it we actually pull down information and test it. Um, 
And then once you once you pass, uh, you get uh, from a third party um, certification, and you can share that on your LinkedIn. And uh, it's uh, it is quite a notable, you know, it's quite a prestigious exam um, and certification. So something to think about if you enjoy Redis, uh, just add that feather to your cap, add a little badge to your shirt. Yeah, and you get the role on Discord as well, which is yes. the icing on the cake, isn't it? But, um, yeah, again, if you are thinking about it or you're in the middle of it or, you know, you just want to talk about it, feel free to join Discord. There is a channel there just for you uh, about that or and or join us in office hours on a Thursday if you want to talk about that. But, yeah, that certification has definitely... Um, it's definitely evolved, hasn't it? You've taken a lot of learnings and really kind of honed that whole process, haven't you? Because um, you used to charge for it, used to be proctored and all of that stuff. And now we've kind of like really kind of evolved it in a really pragmatic way. So uh, so it's still really rigorous um, and people haven't lost anything with the changes that we have made, definitely gained something and like you say it's something you can put on your linkedin that's indisputable because you get a unique key from us when you pass a certificate well from justin justin is the uh, the final arbiter um you get a unique key justin gives you the key that you can plug into linkedin and then anybody who's looking to hire people if they're looking for that certification then it will be very easy for t them to see whether or not you have it cool Anything else you, you all want to add there? I think that sounds great. Good. All right. So we're going to hand over to Guy Royce, who's going to be here in approximately three and a bit minutes time. Thanks again for joining us today. Sorry about that little bit of disruption in the chat. We dealt with them. We don't stand for any of that. I don't let anyone insult my colleagues or me. So goodbye, spammer. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Until then. Look after yourselves and stay safe. Bye, everybody. See ya. Bye.